A very good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, session two, uh, which is on uh, between past and present, tracing India's footprints in Southeast Asia. This session will uh, discuss civilizational aspect connecting India and Southeast Asia and their relevance for contemporary realities. Uh, this session would be chaired by Professor Baladas Gosha. He's a former professor, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. And we'd also like to welcome our very distinguished uh, speakers. So may I request Professor Baladas Gosha to kindly give his opening remarks and conduct the session. Thank you, Professor Gosha. Uh, thank you. I think it has been a great pleasure to be able to chair this session at this interesting seminar, and which is both, of course, in person as well as online, uh, talk about various aspects of India-ASEAN uh, engagements and the future of such engagements, what direction uh, this engagement is moving, uh, and what kind of structure that is emerging. Now, this session particularly uh, refers to uh, between past and present, tracing India's footprints in Southeast Asia. Now, in any kind of engagements or interactions between individuals or countries, or for that matter, regions, uh, it is not a one-way traffic. It is both ways, uh, the arrow moves uh, both ways. And there are, of course, uh, footprints uh, which can be felt in both ways. Uh, in most of the discussions on India's footprints in Southeast Asia, or for that matter, historical relationship between India and Southeast Asia, one talks little more about India's uh, imprints in this region, how Indian cultural influences impacted Southeast Asia's art, literature, uh, uh, textiles, and various other aspects, architecture, and various other aspects of human activities. But I would suggest that there is also a need to find out uh, the impact or if there is any major imprint from Southeast Asia on India as well. Now, the reason why I've been talking about this is that in any kind of relationship where there is equality, there has to be certain understanding about the impact of other people also on you. And it's only on the basis of those uh, understanding that one can build a much more equitable relationship between the two regions. A couple of examples I'll give which are not really uh, <clears throat> known very much. Uh, for example, all the time we have been talking about India's uh, linguistic influences on Southeast Asian languages, uh, Sanskrit, uh, influence of Sanskrit on Southeast Asian languages, on Bahasa Indonesia, on Malayu, on various other languages, Cambodian uh, languages. But I think some of the Malay words can also be found in Indian languages, particularly in Bengali. For example, in East Bengal, you know, the small boats are called sampan. Now, the word sampan is a Malay word, uh, uh, meaning small boats. And I'm sure the word has come from the Malay word. Then there are a couple of other things. For example, uh, lungi. You know, uh, normally it's it's a dress normally used by mostly Muslims in Bengal, but also, I mean, equally by others as well. Now, my own understanding is that the word has actually come from uh, Burmese word, longi, and which is originally sarong, actually, which is in Malay language. So, you know, there could be some instances of various other things in terms of the influence of Southeast Asia also on Indian languages and how, whether there was any migration from that region, whether there are any other kinds of cultural influences from that side 
that also needs to be looked into when one talks about past and present. So that's one point. The second point that I would like to emphasize, and I would like the speakers to also focus on that, is that why are you talking about past? Whether the past has any relevance for the present as well as in the future? The, how can past give us a direction for conducting relationship in the present as well as for the future? So that also, that point also needs to be found out that what extent past is actually relevant. Now, in any kind of sort of the interactions that have been taking place and the future steps that need to be taken, like, for example, in the promotion of uh, tourism, promotion of cultural uh, agreements, uh, preservation of museums, uh, restoration of temples, and various other things that are undertaken in order to build closer relationship between the two regions. Now, apart from that, I think to what extent this past would be relevant for the present generation of people, particularly the younger sections who are going to be the real decision makers in the case of most of these countries. And I think it is their uh, concerns and their understanding of this region that needs to be really looked into. And I think one has to also uh, see that how this present generation can benefit from the past interactions and how the past could be uh, woven into the present needs. So these are some of the remarks that I would like to uh, sort of present before the participants and the presenters. And then at the end of the, their presentations, I would try to uh, make my own observations and comments on the basis of the presentations. Now, I think I'll request the first speaker Professor Zoe Santarita, who is Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Philippines, which I had the opportunity to visit a couple of times and even give lectures there. So I would request Professor Santarita to give his presentation. Professor Santarita. So uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. So uh, as I said, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bashan. Uh, and good afternoon to all. And uh, many thanks to uh, the Indian Council of World Affairs and uh, Research and Information System for Developing Countries for its invitation, especially to Professor Prabhupada. Dr. Giri and uh, Dr. Temjin now. Now, uh, I'd like to respond to uh, the second point of Prof. Goshan regarding the relevance of the past at the present, particularly to the younger generation. So, for the younger generations and young at heart, uh, Temple Run is a familiar video game uh, franchise of 3D endless game running games from one temple to the other. So, just like uh, the game, this study will focus on temples and in particular on the initiative of state and non-state actors in the promotion of tourism through package tours of several temples as India's footprints in the region. So far, the usual package tours offered by travel agents here in Southeast Asia include temple as one only of the stops. In other words, it's not the uh, package that solely focus on temples. And, uh, and I think uh, one uh, point also is that we're trying to replicate or I'd like to propose for the replication of the circuits that uh, as a template uh, invented or maybe uh, introduced by India. So the areas in Southeast Asia uh, include Yogyakarta and Bali in Indonesia, uh, Laos, uh, PDR, Myanmar, Cambodia, and other Southeast Asian countries. Uh, So the introduction of Hinduism and Buddhism in Southeast Asia can be traced back to the beginning of the common era 
although there had been contacts uh, with India for much longer, the advent of two of these uh, two faiths uh, was accompanied by new political notions and customs uh, and infused a new material culture. So Hindu and Buddhist ideologies were manifested in diverse architectural forms according to the varied building traditions of the numerous ethnic groups of Southeast Asia. So the interaction between faith and building uh, traditions thus became the source of uh, for the development of religious architecture in the region. Uh, this paper will look at um, India's, oh, sorry, I think I'm, sorry. So this paper will look at India's connections in two points. So first is concept and practice of pilgrim circuit. Second is India's footprints in Southeast Asia with special emphasis on temple circuits. Or, or rather on temples, and uh, it is defined as uh, the circuit according to Swadesh Darshan is defined as a route on which these three major destinations are located, such that none of these are in the same town, village, or city. At the same time, it would ensure that they are not separated by long distance. They should not. They should have well. Um, Defined entry and exit points. Uh, in other words, a tourist who enters should get motivated to visit all the places identified in the circuit. So a circuit does does ties um, ties together three or more destinations into a unit that the tourism authorities are to develop and that the tourists are to consume. So I. Uh, this I propose actually three pieces of uh, pilgrimage circuit would be philosophy, proximity, and popularity. Now, so when I talk about philosophy, it means the religious philosophical traditions. It could be philosophy, it could be religion. But uh, just for the uh, to have that uh, primary uh, keyword, so we have philosophy, proximity and uh, popularity. So the three pieces of uh, pilgrimage circuit, and I will briefly discuss this, uh, this uh, three pieces in the succeeding slides. Now, in terms of philosophical traditions, the circuits could be developed in themes like, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Hindu Buddhism, and even mix mix uh, religions depending on the press the preference of the clients or of uh, the pilgrims. Uh, please take note, this is not definite. This, these are just only examples of the temples that can be utilized under the sub umbrella. So under the philosophy, we have, for instance, a circuit can be developed under the theme of Hinduism. In the case of Jakarta, we can start with Prambanan to Chandi Baro, Chandi Kidulan, Sambisari and Chandi Ijo. No? So, uh, same for Bali or even for uh, Buddhist in Cambodia. So, we have Angkor Wat, Angkor Tum, and Chai Sri. So those are uh, examples. And, and perhaps even in the latter part of the discussion, we can even explore for Hindu Buddhist and uh, even the mix. No? So, it depends on the, the tour or the, the tour packages offered by. Uh, uh, the tourists or agents. Uh, in terms of uh, proximity, the circuit could be developed based on proximity to cater to the limited time of tourists in the area. So maybe it's just on good one to two days. So uh, I think there must be a package that uh, can cater at, at, to a temple that can be visited in a day or within a day within an accessible geographical location. And a good example of that is of Myanmar uh, from Swedagon Pagoda to Mahaya Sakya and of course the Chow Chat Gi uh, Buddha Temple. Okay. When it comes to uh, popularity, uh, pilgrims could also be offered by a package that suit their needs not just for spiritual uh, wanderers but as tourists as well. No? So the non uh, uh, followers could, could also be uh, 
accommodated and the circuit uh, focuses on you know uh, traditional tourist destinations so a good example of this uh, in, in Jakarta, in Cambodia, in Myanmar now, even uh, we can explore for, for Malaysia because of the uh, geographical location. And uh, as I said, the popularity could be mixed religious philosophical traditions or, or temples under that uh, domain. Now, uh, what are the roles because of the limited time uh, may I just point out the uh, possible role of state and non-state actors so even griffin and raj uh, in their paper have identified several factors that trigger the growth of religious tourism in some places in the world and this include uh, you know a diversified product offerings search for revenue streams uh, cheap uh, flights for perhaps the budget economy or economy flight cultural preservation as also mentioned by uh, Professor Goshal, uh, expanding market, uh, increased number of travel agents, the search for the unusual, which is actually more of a, uh, you know, an, uh, personal, but it could be transformed or translated by, by the travel agents into something that is more unique, something uh, attract, attract, uh, attracted to or you know, serve as an attraction rather to uh, tourists. Uh, the role also of media, uh, there must be a sustainable um, drive. What I mean of a sustainable drive is that uh, there must be uh, some products that can be uh, developed uh, in the context of global trade. And of course, aside from media and so social media, we should also make use of the internet, particularly uh, online booking and increasing the use of smart technology and social media. Now, uh, I agree uh, to Professor Gushal's um, points that, you know, the interaction is not one way. So we are accommodating the Indian tourists at the same time we are also, uh, or I'm thinking also of domestic tourists uh, within the region. No? So we're, we're really just interested we can uh, target both the uh, tourists outside and in, and in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, for the last two slides, um, to continue, I think it is important for the government to Ministry of Tourism or Ministries of Tourism or Departments to design a package, a uh, package tour and complement this by improving road networks, provide tax relief for local industry, invest on infrastructure, uh, develop new facilities, such as uh, maybe helicopter services, just like what uh, Chamdar uh, has done in, in India, help retain its popularity, and also develop guidebooks, uh, circuit management in the promotional literature, and even um, mapping the state and, and its uh, heritage uh, sites. Now, in, in my conclusion, um, I think there is a need to coordinate efforts of all stakeholders. This is not just simply an effort of the government. All sectors should, should be uh, uh, considered, the government, private sectors, tourism, and religious sectors, and uh, support informal economy associated to pilgrimage circuits to become uh, MSMEs the micro medium uh, micro small medium enterprises uh of course after all enlightenment for children should not be necessarily be found in one temple only but could be in one or all of the circuits temples or even perhaps even communing uh, with god in all temples because i think it's very important that enlightenment can be translated to emancipation that emancipation is not only spiritual, but it could be financial and uh, physical, uh, par particularly from poverty and creation of more jobs in the locality. So in, indeed, Temple Run is an upliftment for many people, and uh, it's a clear reminder of India's indelible footprints in action for years to come. So thank you very much. That's all. Back to you, Mr. Gachia. Thank you, Prof. Dushan. Oh, thank you, Professor Santarita. I think it was a very interesting observation and how this tourist circuits and religious circuits could create a kind of a bond 
between the people of India and Southeast Asia. And uh, I think I would add one more with this, that since, you know, Buddhism is considered to be uh, an Indian uh, sort of phenomenon, and, uh, you know, what government of India can do is to have a kind of annual festival on the Buddha Purnima uh, mm -hmm. and bring tourists from uh, particularly the Buddhist countries in Southeast Asia. And this could be a kind of an annual affair. And then mm -hmm. this can also bring a kind of a, not only, uh, you know, people to people contact between the two regions, but this could also be a spiritual exercise on the part of the people who uh, contribute to the faith of okay. Buddhism. So that could be another sort of, you know, tourism uh, event, which could also be organized by the government uh, and uh, even the non-government sectors can also participate in that. Now, I think that I'll shift on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Nalina Gopal, social historian and heritage curator, Singapore. Dr. Gopal. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. I am Miss. I am going to get my doctorate in a few years, so I hope to hear okay. you, Doctor, on another occasion. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my screen as yet. Um, is my screen visible? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, firstly, thank you to Dr. Day and uh, to Dr. Giri for the invitation to participate in this conference. Um, and I would like to uh, make a short presentation that really speaks to my line of work. Um, and in my line of work as a curator, it is very often the visual footprint um, that we are in search of um, to construct a narrative to make it as appealing as we can to the visitor or the viewer. So um, this afternoon, I'd like to speak about the intermediary, essentially the trader or merchant as intermediary and the idea of evidence scattered across um, both South Asia and Southeast Asia. I will, of course, try to address the two points that you have raised, Mr. Chairman, um, in, in terms of two-way flow of culture and the relevance of the past in terms of the present. Um, and I'll do so as we go along. So um, let me begin first, um, you know, with one of the footprints that, of course, we are all keen on searching for, um, some evidence of pre-modern interaction. And we can, of course, do so in the form of epigraphic evidence. And to answer your first question, uh, Mr. Chairman, in terms of two-way flow of culture, I think what is interesting is that this particular stella, the Buddha Gupta inscription, which is a 5th century CE inscription um, installed by um, a traveler or a sea captain, uh, Mahanavika Buddha Gupta, um, is one that is currently in the collection of the Indian Museum in Kolkata. It was discovered in Kedar, um, which is in the Malay Peninsula, in 1834 um, by an officer of the East India Company. And then it was sent to the Asiatic <laughs> Society, uh, and therefore it is now in the collection of the Indian Museum. Um, what is interesting about such uh, epigraphic evidence that is really now transnational is that it serves to bring together the communities of these two regions. Um, this is an inscription that is uh, one of very few um, and probably the earliest inscription in terms of Buddhist um, trade contact with the Malay Peninsula. Um, so when visiting the Indian Museum, this is an inscription that's on display and it brings to light that very early connection for going to the museum. Um, of course, um, this is also sort of linked to the whole idea of archaeological evidence. And when we talk of a two-way flow of culture, um, you know, when you look at Sangam literature, there's very early reference to Kedah, um, 
which is in the Malay Peninsula. Now, Kheda was known as Karagam, um, and Karagam is a term that appears in the second century CE Tamil text, Patinapali. And Karagam really is derived from the Tamil word Karag, which means black, or rather iron or black rock. Um, and this particular um, you know, phenomenon perhaps is linked to the idea that Kedah used to be an important center that was exporting out and involved in um, the export of iron and also sort of uh, forging um, iron-based uh, products that were very much coveted in South India. So what you see on screen are actually two year or uh, tube fragments that were used at um, the iron smelting um, you know, sites that are located at Sungai Batu in Keda and are now in the collection of the Center for Global Archaeological Research at the University of Science Malaysia. Behind the Tuya, you also see some beads which are scattered there, and these are actually Indo-Pacific trade beads. Uh, beads, um, for example, some of the smaller beads, like the carnelian beads, were typical of what was produced in Arikamedu, a few kilometers away from Pondicherry, and it was uh, literally traded across um, to the west and the east, really, as currency. Um, now, connected to this, of course, is looking at um, evidence that is also Literally, and um, I mentioned one of the poems earlier, the Patinapali, which is a second century poem, and in it there are stanzas that refer to the ways of uh, Keda arriving in Puhat, one of the old uh, port capitals of the Cholas. And the other is an interesting literary manuscript called the Mani Mekale by Sitala Shatanar. Um, and this is a 5th to 6th century CE text um, written in Tamil. And in it, we find reference to Java as Javakam. Um, and it really reminds us that back then, um, you know, there was no idea of Java almost as a foreign land, but it was really seen as part of the Buddhist cosmopolis um, back then. Apologies, one moment. I'm not able to. Um, and from there, I think, um, you know, when we look at crossing the seas, um, we might want to turn to some evidence of maritime relics. Now, this particular um, example that's on screen is neither found in Southeast Asia or present South Asia. It's actually in the collection of the Te Papa Museum in Wellington in New Zealand. Now, this particular bell is rather fascinating. It was collected by William Colenso, who was a British missionary in uh, New Zealand, and he discovered it uh, being used by um, Maori women at near Wangare, and they were using it to cook potatoes. Um, but he found that it had some inscriptions on it, and it turned out to be a Tamil inscription. Now, he contacted people who were residing in the Strait Settlements, which uh, would include Singapore, Penang, and Malacca, and he also contacted experts who were in South Asia, and he had them decipher it. Um, so it reads, um, Mohidin Bakshudya Kappaludam Mani. Um, so back uh, before we had had a look at this ourselves, um, the Te Papa had actually catalogued this as a bell dating back to the 14th or the 15th century CE, and that the bell actually carried an inscription of the name of the trader, the intermediary. But in actual fact, Mohidin Baksh was actually a very popular name for ships that were actually, um, you know, um, commissioned by Tamil Muslim traders who were in the southeast coast or the Coromandel coast. Um, and this is uh, also sort of pointing to their Sufi, um, you know, um, trend in the community and really asking for the preservation of Mohideen for safe passage. So this particular bell, which is really a maritime relic in some sorts, is actually a fragment that would have um, nobody knows how it found its way to New Zealand, but, um, you know, and there's no actual record of trading links existing as far as that. But when we talk of footprints, perhaps it's important to look even beyond these uh, two regions. Um, one, um, maybe to turn to uh, evidence that has been relocated to former, um, you know, um, uh, to, to regions where uh, colonialists came from. So there are some evidence there, but this particular one is quite interesting that it found its way all the way to New Zealand. 
Um, another possible uh, source for some footprints would be regional legends. And on screen, you see an image of the Shajara Melayu, which is actually a genealogical text um, of the Malay kings of Singapore and Malacca. And it's a 17th century CE text bearing several legends that points to uh, connections um, with, for instance, the Chola Kingdom, which is really uh, addressed as the Kingdom of Kling, um, and there are both, um, you know, um, marital relations. Um, there are royal as well as, um, you know, other connections that are actually talked of in the legends that are preserved in this literary text. It's just but one example. Now, another example um, that would really point to some maritime connections and a footprint of it. When we talk of a footprint in water, um, it's quite interesting that, of course, um, you know, very little has survived. And uh, there are some shipping vessels that have been uh, unearthed recently. And uh, particularly, uh, there would be the Shah Munshir, for instance, uh, an 18th century, uh, 18th century CE wreck um, that had uh, its itinerary going from Canton to Bombay, and it was carrying Chinese wares. So it actually points to, and it was found off the shores of Singapore. So in terms of footprints and uh, for intermediaries, I think it's important to look beyond land as well. Um, now, of course, I think um, a lot more known. Um, and when we look at footprints, commodities themselves that have survived are perhaps the most visually interesting um, in terms of uh, traditions that have survived alongside the footprints. Um, this, for example, is a textile that was traded from the Coromandel, Coromandel coast to Thailand in the 18th century. Um, now, I think when we talk about links between the past and present, um, footprints also point to living settlements and communities. And one such example that I would like to draw your attention to is that of the Chitti Malacca community. So the Chitti Malacca are essentially descendants of uh, traders from the Koromanga coast who settled in the Malacca Sultanate period in the streets of Malacca, particularly the city of Malacca. And they saw a sort of changing status when Malacca went from being Malacca Sultanate to going under the administration of the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British subsequently. So during the Dutch period, a lot of their trading um, you know, rights were uh, taken over by the Dutch, and they were then given land grants. And thereafter, you begin to see a very settled idea of this community who marries um, local women. So this for exa exis, uh, example on the left is a map by a Portuguese um, cartographer, um, and it shows us, I've marked out in red, uh, two names. One is Kampung Chelin, and the other is Trunkera, both of which are part of the present day, um, you know, um, settlements that are identified with by the Malacca community. So in uh, Malacca, if you've visited Malacca, there is one of the oldest temples there, um, dating to the Dutch period of Malacca, the 18th century, particularly 1781 is when the temple is being built based on some Dutch grants, um, land grants. So this particular temple, <laughs> It's definitely one of the uh, past and present links in terms of built heritage, and it continues to be one that is, um, you know, owned by the Chitti Malacca community and under the management of the local Natukute Chettiar community. Um, so when we talk of uh, two-way flow, I think these temples are very much kept um, functional with a regular supply of whether it is temple musicians or priests who come in from South Asia. Um, of course, turning to the archive is, of course, one of the most, um, um, you know, common things that historians do, and I didn't want to leave that out. And in this particular instance, I'll show you uh, one of the land grants that I mentioned earlier um, of the Chitti Malacca community receiving land for the construction of the Sri Poyada Vinayagar Murti Temple from the Dutch administration. And on the left is actually an extract list of the population at Singapore in the 19th century, which still refers to natives of the Coromandel coast, many of whom were prominent traders, including the very first man that we can put a name to, um, arriving from Penang to Singapore, who was of Indian descent, Narayana Pillai. 
Um, I think when we were talking of linguistics, um, we just thought in, ter in terms of the Chitty Malaka community, it would be interesting to point out that they speak a particular Creole that is unique to them, and it includes a complex mix of Bazaar Malay, Tamil and Chinese. And um, there are some Tamil words that are still retained in their language, whether it is to define relationships, some modes of attire, or even um, ritualistic um, lingo. So in terms of aesthetics, and uh, you know, I was talking of attire and retaining some words, uh, on the top right corner, you see a batik headgear. Now, it's definitely Southeast Asian in appearance, but interestingly, the Chittimalaka call it the Talapa Chittimalaka, and Talapa is actually a Tamil word for headgear. On the bottom left, you see um, a pair of anklets, and again, these are very South Indian in design, and this is something that is very much part of the female attire, um, and it is actually combined with either a sarong kabaya or a, a sarong with a baju, so it's again something that is extremely Creole in appearance. Um, and lastly, I do before I just make a quick note on the settlement, I just thought I would talk about collective memory as an important um, link between the past and present. So in um, Kajaberang or Kampung Chitti, which is a living settlement of the Chitti Malacca in Malacca, you see that um, certain festivals have actually continued on from the 19th century. This particular festival is the Sembayang Dato Chachar, um, that was actually uh, a title that has been given to Mariaman there, so the goddess Mariaman. Um, and it's essentially the Mariaman Tirivara or a festival that is um, related with the goddess worship. And it takes place annually in the month of May. Um, there are several Hindu temples that have been constructed by the Chitti Malaka community in that kampung or settlement. And this is because predominantly the community is still Hindu. Um, with um, some Muslim and Christian conversions, especially in the diaspora. And many of them recall um, a lot of uh, the incidents that have been handed down from generation to generation, which perhaps is one of the great sources for information on the Chitti Malacca. And lastly, I just want to leave you with some images of the living settlement in Kampung Chitti to just show you how the past is a living footprint in Malacca. Thank you. Oh, that was an excellent presentation, I think, uh, in tracing the footprints, Indian footprints. You had used the intermediary, uh, the Chittimalays and others, in, in the traders and business, uh, the merchants who uh, traveled from India to that region and uh, not only uh, traded, but also left a deep imprint in the cultural evolution of that particular region. So I think I'll shift to the next speaker, uh, Professor Shuchandra Ghosh from Hyderabad. Yeah. Good afternoon. And um, honorable chairperson, my fellow panelists, I, at the outset, I'd like to thank ICWA and RIS, particularly Professor Prabhid Day, for inviting me to share this, my ideas in this platform. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, which I think I, I need to share. Yeah. Uh, so actually, the previous speaker has made my work much more easier because I was, uh, she started with a very interesting inscription, uh, which is uh, in the Indian Museum, the Mahanavika inscription. So what I'm doing today is I'm focusing on, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a micro study because I'm trying to look at the vast epigraphical material uh, found in different regions of Southeast Asia and attempt to present the scripts and languages that left their footprints in inscriptions of early Southeast Asia in a historical perspective. I'm a historian of early India, so I limit my uh, sources to 13th century CE. And I really appreciate the comment by our chairperson about the two-way inflow. And in our studies, we have seen that two-way inflows, the, of course, we have more we talk, we talk more about the Indian interactions, but in the field of ceramics, 
and artistry, we have some uh, real footprints from the other side, which we can talk of. But today I'm focusing mainly in the on the epigraphic. And I really uh, liked the idea, uh, the term when you talked about Shampan, because yes, when we go to Chachitagong, particularly we hear so much of Shampan, those boating vessels. So uh, therefore it's like a reliving memory of visits to Chittagong. Now coming to the uh, theme of my paper, I have uh, it's titled Situating Epigraphic Language and Script in Early Southeast Asia, Facets of Indian Interaction. So I would start by saying that the importance of epigraphic material is unquestionable for the appreciation of the past. We know that from the fourth century onwards, inscriptions written in Sanskrit began to appear in uh, countries like Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Though it has not been possible to study all the inscriptions, uh, but a paleographical study of some of the major inscriptions give us some pattern of interaction between different areas of the Indian subcontinent and various regions within South Asia. And, and through my uh, through my study, I'll show how that when the, the 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 way the coasts actually interacted. When it is Coromontal coast, the uh, the pattern of script is much more in the Pallavagrantha script. But when it is the uh, Bengal coast, then we have the Siddha Matrika, the different kind of scripts that were used in Bengal. So uh, going further, we find that the inscriptions are normally said to be written in Pallava Grantha, which I just mentioned, or it is known as the South Indian characters of Brahmi, using the term South India to include Deccan also. The presence of the Pallava script is a pointer to the association of Southern India with Southeast Asia. The distinguishing feature marking the southern alphabets from the northern one is the little book uh, that is attached um, in, through in, uh, in the scripts that we find. So this is, but uh, let me first just show you this inscription. This is an, uh, a very early inscription from Nagarjunikonda, which has this kind of long hooks and this kind of uh, script were borrowed or transmitted to the regions of Southeast Asia. Next, when we look at this Pallava Grantha script, we find this the long hooks. So gradually from the uh, from the small hooks to the long hooks, there was a, a movement. And this has been found, can be recorded in inscriptions also from Southeast Asia. So this means that there is, uh, it is a pointer to the unmistakable presence of the uh, persons having knowledge of both the Eastern style of Brahmi and that of the Southern style in the area concerned. Now, uh, why I say about talk about Eastern style, because here we have, um, uh, these are the, all the different types of script used in inscriptions in seals. And this is a seal where we have this term Rujjo. Now this script is actually Eastern Brahmi. So in the same area, we find the use of the Vallabhagrantha script as well as the Eastern Brahmi through which I will come later on also. Uh, what we do find is another, the question is uh, uh, the, in when we look at the west coast of India, we find that there are a lot of inscriptions which are using or the scripts which are using the box headed script. Why do we call it box headed? Uh, my presentation a little technical, but I'd like to explain to you. Uh, see, if you can look at these areas, these are the serif and the serif is looks like a box. So it has it that it is society. This is from the Bakataka inscription. But interestingly, we find this box headed variety of scripts datable between 5th and 7th centuries or uh, something uh, in the areas of uh, Vietnam, Thailand. And uh, the question then comes in, why do we find influence of a region from the West Coast rather than the more plausible East Coast? And this is one has to ponder upon. Now, if we uh, think of this, then it may be suggested that if trade was one of the 
purveyors or one of the agencies of transformation. Uh, we all know that when we are studying India relationship between regions of India and regions of Southeast Asia, we are looking at agencies and among the most important agent uh, trade has been trade and traders have been uh, located as a very important agent of tra like trans com of communication or looking at the social uh, nearness between the two regions. Now, it, it, we can say that it must have been the traders from Karnataka who played a dominant role. In the contemporary period, we have reference to the merchant guilds called the 500 Swamis of Ayavole, which is Aihol uh, area of Karnataka, who were later on active in Tamil Nadu and also operated in Southeast Asia. So the boxed variety of Karnataka must have reached through them. Gradually, the southern variety of Brahmi made its impact on the already existing uh, uh, box headed variety. So, in this uh, two examples, th this is from Vokan inscription in Vietnam, which is said to be one of the earliest inscriptions uh, uh, having some Indic script in Southeast Asia. And the other is the famous Yupa inscription of Mula Varman. Both the inscriptions, if you carefully look at this thing, then you'll find that at the serif, then you'll find the box is uh, the box is very prominent. So the box has a variety reached uh, this region. Uh, we can uh, perceive or we can say that from Karnataka and through the, mal, um, the merchant guilds of Karnataka, which is the uh, Swamis of 500 Swamis of Ayavole. I'll come to this merchant guilds later on uh, for another purpose. Now, this inscription shows the Siddha Matrika script. Now, this is a script which was largely used in the period from 7th century to 13th century in regions of North India, particularly in Bengal, Bihar, present-day Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. Now, uh, we have reference to this Siddha Matrika script in the list of Alberuni, who talks about the different kinds of script in India. Uh, so here we find that this script was used in the tablets, like the so-called votive tablets of Sri Lanka and Myanmar in Cambodian inscriptions of the time of King Yashogarma, as well as on the golden disc and inscribed stone in the relic chamber of Muara Taku. Now it is evident that the scripts of these pre-Nagari inscriptions sharply differ from those of the earlier uh, inscriptions because here we have uh, the serif is we have an angular V. I, I have a better example uh, where you can see that you have, we had seen the box headed. Now we can see the angular uh, serifs in this, which is known as the Siddha Matrika script. Uh, these were uh, uh, actually this, I can say that is a pointer to the contact of an intimate nature between the Pala monarchs of Bengal and Bihar and the Shailendra rulers of Java. The cultural ties of the Shailendra monarchs with the Pala rulers of Bengal are not only reflected in the Siddha Matrika scripts comparable to those of contemporary Bengal, but also from the point of view of paleography. And we have the reference to Kumara Ghosha, which is all uh, known to everybody, the preceptor of the Shailendra king, who was an in inhabitant of Gora. Now then at Jambi, we also have, uh, in which is in Northwest Palembang, the Buddhist creed, which is Ye Dharma, which is written in proto gorya characters of about the 9th century CE. Uh, but what is interesting is that we have even the spellings uh, are like the pronunciation are uh, actually shapes the spellings. For example, when we are one is using Sita Matrika in Bengali, uh, we know we do not have the word year. So we have uh, like J. So Ye Dharma is used as J Dharma. So what we find is that the nearness of the two regions uh, here in this place, uh, when we, uh, when uh, Professor Subarailu and uh, Pro Professor K. V. Ramesh had visited this place, we find that this uh, is known as not as Ye Dharma, but it is known as J Dharma. So the nearness of the re uh, re regions actually influence influence the pronunciation of the place. So this regional variation is linked to the question of close contact between uh, these regions. Okay. Uh, so Arakan and Chittagong, uh, the southeastern Bangladesh, is very closely related. And we have many other examples to show, even from the numismatic scenario, the kind, the kind of relationship that Arakan has with present-day Chittagong region. 
Now coming uh, from the next from this area, if we look also uh, to the scripts where sometimes uh, su uh, suitable uh, weather for the local needs and phonetics were very uh, early in Southeast Asia. So you have like instances where uh, if the inscription is uh, Tamaraya Yogeshwara, so it is it is written as the Yogeshwara, the Yogeshwara. So this extra T is the, uh, is found, which is actually stands for Yogeshwara. So what is important to note is that behind the facade of general similarity, which suggests some kind of contact between the areas under consideration, the local varieties emphasize the importance of local genius. The Southeast Asian scribes who adapted the scripts to local needs. So my point of uh, like though we do not find when we talk of uh, the footprints in the Southeast Asian footprints in the field of epigraphy in uh, India, what we can say is that even though the index scripts were borrowed, the language were borrowed, but the Southeast Asian uh, the the right composers or the ins or the sculptors or the engravers they had actually changed it or they have adopted something and they use their own kind of local variations uh, and which suited the local needs of the, the pronunciation and also the words. So from uh, so now we uh, when we talk of this this brief review, I have given you a very uh, very general overview of the pattern that emerges. Uh, we find that it is the brisk maritime land linkages of South India, which includes the Andhra and the Karamondal coast. Played and this coast played a dominant role in the dissemination of scripts belonging to the southern type of Brahmi. When the Bengal coast was active in interaction, it was the Siddha Matrika script which played a significant role in the writing of the region. The merchants plying in the Bay of Bengal helped at the infusion of Central Indian uh, script or the Karnataka box headed variety. It appears that paleographical developments in South Asia and Southeast Asia developed on parallel lines. So Sanskrit and Pali have had considerable long term impact upon the linguistic and intellectual cultures of Southeast Asia because Buddhist skills, Buddhist texts were written in Pali language. Now, when we come to the Sanskrit, a few words would be, uh, I think, would be uh, important for uh, delve, to delve upon. Uh, we have, we are aware of Sheldon Pollock's work. Uh, which has dealt extensively on the spread of Sanskrit cosmopolitan culture in countries of Southeast Asia. Uh, but uh, the point is that I have already su uh, suggested that on the basis of paleography that it was the West Central Coast which was responsible for the transculturation process. And here Sheldon Pollock's uh, work also plays a dominant role because to support my contention, because he talks of uh, in the similar line by citing another type of example, the use of the Shaka era. Now, if we look at the inscriptions from um, uh, Southeast Asia, we find that many of the inscriptions are using Shaka era, but Shaka era was not used in the uh, by the Pallavas or, or the Cholas. So it was the uh, why we find that in the uh, Karnataka region, uh, the Chalukya ruler publications inscription Ravikirti, uh, which he wrote, there the Shaka era is used, and if they have Suri, they have reference to the Shaka era. So one can cite here the example, uh, this these example to see that uh, the influx, the, the movement was from. So the transmission of the uh, paleography of or of uh, these you know the, the sites of uh, the paleography available in the countries of Southeast Asia. Uh, another important point the, which we have to keep in mind is the remarkable development uh, of uh, keep, uh, that happened without end of power or the pressure of any kind of imperial administrative between them. So it was perhaps the result of continuous movement of intellectuals both uh, between both the regions. So fi we find that in case of Khmer or in Java, Sanskrit was used as a mode of political culture and it was exclusively the cosmopolitan language of elite self-presentation. 
We learn from the inscriptions that some ruling elites were of Indian origin and some of their ancestors were said to be well versed in the Vedic texts. So Sanskrit learning was natural to them. The Khmer elites were also well versed in Sanskrit. Sanskrit was looked as a power language, which could be the only language for eulogizing or narrating a royal person's life. Therefore, neither Khmer nor Javanese was used for Prashasti writing. So how, whatever inscriptions we have received, we do not find the, in the eology portion, uh, uh, the, uh, the script, uh, the language of Khmer or Javanese, we have only the Sanskrit as the eology uh, in the eology portion of, a in, of an inscription. Uh, what is striking is that we don't even have Prakrit. So Prakrit could not make a headway in the uh, regions of Southeast Asia. But there is another language which we know, and that is the Tamil language and script, which have been found in Southeast Asia, mainly in Sumatra and Peninsula Thailand. The presence of Tamil inscriptions indicates direct trade relations between Coromandel Coast and certain parts of Southeast Asia, and the residence of Tamil speaking Indians in those regions. Eight of these inscriptions dating from the mid 9th to the late 13th centuries written on stone wholly or partly in Tamil language and using can you, Tamil script. Can you, can you finish it in two, three minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm all talking about the Tamil script, use of Tamil languages in these inscriptions. So one is the uh, Takwapa inscription, which has been found uh, from Takwapa region. But significantly, in this region, we have another very interesting uh, seal. Uh, since we started, uh, there was this reference to Mahanavika Buddha Gupta. Here also we have the reference to a Navika Brihaspati Sarman. So this, and my uh, guess is this is also a Mahanavika because in a small sand, he is using a golden seal. So in a small seal, it could not be uh, given. Uh, coming to the other Tamil inscriptions, we have this Nakhon Sitamarat in the East Coast, where also we find Tamil inscriptions, the presence of the Tamil inscriptions. And uh, the famous Baru's inscriptions is well known. I'm not going into that. So I'll come to the conclusion. So uh, what I did was I was trying to understand these different kinds of uh, Tamil inscriptions. And when we found that the local, uh, they were very much into uh, the used by the merchants and uh, for the, and it were for the merchants. So in conclusion, uh, I can say that it may be said that from the beginning of the writing in Southeast Asia, Sanskrit played a preeminent role in the cultural life of its people. And I have already mentioned that Prakrit, we do not have reference, but though archaeological findings suggest strong interaction between the two regions from very early times, in case of script and language, the impact could be found only from around 4th century CE, when Sanskrit became a courtly language. Parallel to Sanskrit, we have the presence of Pali. And when the Coromandel coast became very active, the Tamil merchants began to traverse the Bay of Bengal in search of commercial success, Tamil language and script Found is but what we find is that what uh, that South Indian merchant inscription that shows that there were communication between the users of the two languages. But Tamil as a language perhaps could not make much dent into the political life of the people of Southeast Asia because all the inscriptions which are talking, which are given by the royalty and which um, uh, shows the political cultural life of Southeast Asia are mostly in Sanskrit. So these are some of the Tamil inscriptions and uh, here I have actually uh, marked these areas where we find those inscriptions. So here I mentioned Jambi and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I think I should stop share. And how some of it has also been adapted because I, I mentioned about, you know, the two way thing. And sometimes yeah. even if the footprints are not uh, found, of Southeast Asia in India, but at least one can see that how Southeast Asians had adapted to their local traditions, many of these uh, cultural aspects, and made it a unique feature of their own culture. Thank you. Uh,
Now, I think I'll request Dr. Rajiv Ranjan Chaturvedi to give his presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, first, I would like to express my sincere thanks to ICWA and AIC, uh, particularly Professor Praveed Day, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this important topic. Uh, in his uh, opening remarks, uh, Professor Gosal made uh, excellent observations and he asked us to talk about relevance of the past that while we are talking about shared heritage, shared cultural richness, how it is relevant to our present. So, uh, sir, in my presentation, I plan to uh, touch upon interwoven legacies of the past and how we see the blooming of culture and creativity and finally, uh, touch upon five key issues that require attention for greater collaboration to create a tapestry for the future. ASEAN and India have been friends and neighbors since time immemorial. Shared cultural markers and footprints bear testimony to a rich tapestry of exchange of cultural ethos. Our habits, customs, folklore, textiles, cuisine, arts, and architecture enlighten us about our shared cultural legacy. Further, our religions, philosophies, trade, commerce connect us. We continue to cherish the reliving uh, streams of cultural ties that flows through the hearts of the people of ASEAN and India. The cultural embrace between ordinary people of ASEAN and India has immense potential to transform this partnership. Amid the churning of the world, ASEAN and India are celebrating their three decades of companionship. However, a miasma of suspicion and anxiety negates the spirit of collegiality, particularly due to limited understanding of each other and sometimes due to broken communication. ASEAN and India need to relieve the intimate contacts of the past by nurturing the epistemology of pluralism and by creating wide profusion of distinctive yet ever shifting cultures in one of the most dynamic region of the earth. An aesthetically enriched cultural integration calls for an innovative cultural framework to cultivate the true spirit of friendship. When emerging challenges have created an environment of despondency and cynicism, profound heterogeneity and asymmetrical prosperity of ASEAN and India make it imperative for both to optimize the existing institutional mechanisms and inject more robustness to enrich the cultural aspects of their relationship. Underlining past splendor is not enough to convert present challenges into opportunities. We need more active participation for, from all stakeholders. When we look at the interwoven legacies of the past, a peninsula of numerous culture, religions, and cults, the Southeast Asia region has been a meeting ground for cultures and civilizations. The region has nurtured its own myths, legends, arts, and amazingly broad spectrum of styles that portray most Southeast Asian states. While there is evidence of intimate cultural and civilizational contact between Southeast Asia and India, a lack of understanding of some unbroken cultural links and traditions perhaps due to autochthonous norms and values has resulted in a visible gap in understanding and sensitivities. Professor Gosal in his opening remarks uh, underlined these facts that there was two way process so, uh, of exchange. Numerous historical currents have fastened ASEAN India cultural connections over centuries. The diversity of cultures and traditions is multifarious in the ASEAN member countries. The cross-pollination of Indian culture, ideas, and religion across the region <clears throat> played a considerable role in the political culture landscape of ASEAN. India's cultural and civilizational imprints influence the emergence of a statehood and interstate system in Southeast Asia. Even today, the influence of ancient India can be seen in places and personal names in commonly used words and in arts and crafts. Studies shows that during the first 600 years or so, Indian cultural symbols, including writing and statuary, were adopted in whole with little to no modifications. However, 7th century onwards saw the creative adaptation of Indic culture by the Southeast Asians. 
resulting in interesting local variations. Thus, the countries in the, this region adapted and modified a whole range of foreign ideas and rules to suit their interest and local context. This process of imaginating adaptation preserved and in some cases amplified local beliefs and practices while producing a significant but evolutionary historical changes in domestic politics and interstate relations. The Indian cultural influence therefore was an adaptation and not an acceptance. For example, the localization of Indian influence can be seen in the depiction of mythological traditions and various adaptations of religious and cultural performance, such as exhibits of legendary bird, Garuna, or depiction of Samudra Manthan, or churning of the ocean in various Southeast Asian countries. Moreover, the Southeast Asian gave us as much as they learned from Indian culture and civilization. The influence of Indian civilization of ASEAN region is highly evident. <coughs> <coughs> Much literature is available on India's influence in this region. Southeast Asia's impact on cultural and historical event in India has not drawn adequate attention. The, however, the evidence suggests that the cultural influence flowed both ways. Southeast Asia has also contributed to enriching India's culture and traditions. This cross-pollination of ideas and the spiritual interactions between them has left an indelible mark on the regional art, architecture, culture, language, and people-to-people -people exchanges, stimulated by a spirit of creativity, cooperation, and collaboration. Southeast Asian established cultural contacts and came to a study at Nalanda University. Some research suggests that several Southeast Asian innovations, such as rice cultivation, bronze production, ideographs, outrigger canoe, and iron and iron technology, among others, were transmitted by traders and sailors to coastal India. In a fascinating episode of history, a 12-year boy was brought from Champa, from a distant family branch of the Pallava to the capital, <clears throat> Kanchipuram, and crowned as King Nandivarman Pallavamala, who ruled with great distinction and built a grand Vaikunth Perumal temple. Similarly, Idli, which is very popular this one of the favorite food in uh, southern India, traces its origin to Southeast Asia. When we look at blooming of culture and creativity, better connectivity and connections through social media have led to greater people-to-people -people connectivity and collaborations between India and ASEAN. Uh, despite, uh, and it reflects that despite travel restrictions, uh, we have uh, Excellent presentations from uh, speakers from Southeast Asia. They shared their uh, views uh, through these platforms, online platforms. The cuisine of Southeast Asian region, once found only in metro cities, are making rounds in small Indian towns. India is witnessing a culinary revolution in which Thai and Vietnamese cuisines make their presence felt in most part of India. In Indian weddings, feast, khao sui and laksa are eaten with gusto. With its scenic natural beauty, historical monuments, and rich biodiversity, India is gradually attracting the attention of tourists from ASEAN region. All this has led to a better appreciation of one other cultures. But is that enough or how we create a tapestry for the future? Uh, despite a rich cultural heritage legacy, ASEAN's and India's cultural connectedness and communications are limited. We live in an interconnected world in the age of diffused culture based on a modern outlook that relies on science and rationality to address emerging challenges. While we celebrate our past and continue to follow several rich cultural traditions, we also witness modifications, adaptations, and infusion of new elements in our artistic journey. The contemporary dynamics of the region and the fast-changing global society brings new ideas and pose different challenges. Therefore, ASEAN and India need to deliberate upon issues on which they could share their expertise and experience and learn from each other. So I suggest five key issues that require greater attention uh, for collaboration between ASEAN and India. The first and most important is the safety of cultural heritage. The sale of antiquities is a lucrative source of income and illegal trade in art and historical artifacts 
funds terrorist activities. Terrorist groups use the black market to sell art and historical artifacts obtained illegally from conflict zones and then use those funds to support their activities around the world. Therefore, the protection of cultural heritage is related to national security and requires greater coordination and cooperation to end such transnational crimes. In today's world of swift communication, policymakers should work proactively to highlight the positive things in their countries and engage more constructively to address pressing global problems. The cultural aspect of external interface is a powerful tool in the government's diplomatic scheme. A pragmatic cultural policy could drive the convergence of interest towards cooperation in finding common solutions. The fusion of our cultural past could be enriched further through robust collaborations between ASEAN and India at present. The second issue is that of intercultural communication. Culture is dynamic and it changes with time and circumstances. Cultural groups face continual challenge from such powerful forces as environmental upheavals, pandemics, wars, migration, the influx of immigrants, and growth of new technologies. As a result, cultural culture changes and evolves. More importantly, the knowledge remains limited due to a lack of <clears throat> intercultural communication. Intercultural communications are vital to develop a better understanding of each other's practices and sensitivities, likes and dislikes. This could be helpful in boosting mutual interactions. Digital technology can be an important medium for effective communications. Public digital trans infrastructure offers immense opportunity to directly reach out to ordinary people. ASEAN and India can transform the intercultural communication space by using digital technology. This can also empower the people to strengthen their capability to become trusted collaborators. The third issue is the management of cultural resources. Culture and cultural resources represent a vital asset in the effort to develop tourism across the ASEAN member countries. Moreover, tourism is highly dependent on cultural icons and proper management strategies which ensure that culture heritage is preserved and contributes significantly to the material well-being and the stability of their societies. ASEAN and India should enhance their technological and professional cooperation in cultural resource management, which is happening already. The fourth issue is uh, dealing with the cultural industry. Both ASEAN and India have experienced an explosion of popular culture products such as movies, pop music, animation, comic, television programs, and fashion magazines, among others, that have expanded and deepened their reach domestically and internationally and across regional and even national borders. Multi-directional flow of popular culture have intensified to reach consumers in different national and linguistic areas and have substantially decentralized the region's popular culture market. As a result, consumers are exposed to various popular cultures to a great extent and are characterized by a diversity of consumption habits and lifestyles. Indeed, there is a realization among governments that cultural industries are an excellent source for enhancing the country's soft power and have potential of cultivating lucrative export enterprise. How the culture industries of ASEAN and India collaborate will depend much on the government's policies and support. Indeed, it requires a greater coordination and a structured approach. Finally, through, though ASEAN and India have initiated programs on cultural and civilizational linkages, it is equally important to document civilizational ties and shared cultural symbols and disseminate them widely through various mediums and platforms to enhance general awareness of both sides. I think uh, setting up of uh, Common Archival Resource Center at, and ASEAN India Network of Universities are some important steps uh, in this regard. Today morning, uh, we heard of references of various scholarship and collaborations of skill center and academic institutions in the, <clears throat> in the inaugural sessions. Perhaps we need more clarity and easy procedures for students uh, to gain admissions for studies and research. I think sharing of knowledge and joint research projects of common interest need active support to enable research collaborations and that can help 
promoting a greater partnership. Though culture is increasingly become an essential aspect of engagement, there are no culture ministry dialogue among the existing annual uh, institutional mechanism between ASEAN and India. ASEAN and India need to work on collective, consultative and inclusive approaches for greater coordination, a structured approach to deepen cultural ties further. The culture ministry dialogue can play a significant role in this regard. To conclude my presentation, I would say that India and ASEAN have much in common in the cultural realm, from religion, archaeology, customs and folklore to literature, cuisines, the arts and dramas. The two sides have a legacy that they should be proud of. However, it is important for India and ASEAN to constructively address common challenges to ensure that their cultural ties continue to flourish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think the four presentations were very rich and practically covered the entire gamut of the relationship between India, Southeast Asia, and the impacts that it created for each other. I'm not going to repeat what already has been said by the four presenters. But the takeaways from this is that the point I think everyone agreed is that culture is not one way traffic. It flows both ways. Second is adaptation, modification. I think even if their imprints are not uh, felt uh, in a significant manner in India, but it should be pointed out that the adaptations took place to suit their local conditions. I think one more point that Rajiv had mentioned actually about the subject of pluralism. I think that most of the Southeast Asian countries are plural societies, so is India. And I think all kinds of challenges have emerged in the maintenance of a plural society in both these societies, India and Southeast Asia. And I think they should also devote their attention how they could learn from their past experience to actually gain some knowledge about the present and how they could uh, uh, utilize those experiences for the benefit of the present uh, relationship between various communities, religious groups, and other ethnic groups within these societies. So pluralism is another aspect which I think needs to be remembered in terms of interactions between India and Southeast Asia. I think another point that also has been mentioned in the process of the presentation is that many of these things uh, need to be disseminated also because, you know, people are proud of their civilizational heritage. And sometimes people are not aware of those heritages. So this needs to be actually disseminated. And in fact, if both the government of India as well as the countries of Southeast Asia, in their cultural agreements, they can incorporate some of these measures to popularize some of these ideas about the common heritage of the two people. That could go a long way in building friendship between the two peoples. And that brings me to the last point, that despite all the cultural heritages, common cultural heritages, you know, the people-to-people -people contact between the people of Southeast Asia and India are not that big. Uh, there are contacts at the government level, the business level, but at the people popular level, there's not much contact. Tourism and various other measures that have been suggested in this four presentations could act as a kind of a, an advice to both India and Southeast Asia to promote people-to-people -people contact, because it is only through people-to-people -people contact that you can build eternal friendship and a bond that can really stand the test of time. I think with this remark, if, I, if there are any questions to any of these presenters, I think they're welcome.
No questions. No questions. There are no questions. No questions. No questions. So, in that case, I think we can bring it to a close this particular se session. One minute each time. Uh, in fact, if the presenters have any uh, comments to make, closing remarks, I think they are welcome now. Uh, sir, uh, you mentioned in your uh, remarks about uh, to improve the people-to-people -people connect. I think uh, there are uh, different existing mechanisms and uh, whether connectivity is uh, gradually growing. But both the regions have a lot of young people and they go out for studies. And uh, uh, you are a professor yourself and we are also part of educational institutions. So our uh, interest is in that how we attract more uh, students from ASEAN countries and how uh, two-way academic exchanges happen, which will uh, in a way create a strong foundation for people to people connect. Those students who go back to their uh, respective countries, they become our brand ambassadors. So what we hear uh, being at Nalanda, we hear from students that our admission process is quite cumbersome. So if uh, government can think of making an easier process of admission uh, for students as well as for researchers who want to come to India to do their research on various aspects, be it fintech or history or culture, um, that uh, get facilitated. So those uh, scholarships which are available for that um, can be used. Still, it's underutilized and uh, not many ASEAN students are coming to. Perhaps we can reach out to ASEAN countries uh, in forms of education fairs or creating education enclaves. So addressing their concerns that how ASEAN countries are expecting from us so that we attract more students. Um, and some uh, countries in ASEAN like Singapore, uh, Gradually, it's starting to be important education hub. A large number of Indian students are going to Singapore because they are also providing uh, education at our Western uh, institutions. So I think uh, uh, this will be point I want to put before you for consideration. Thank you. I think that's a very good suggestion. In fact, I myself have spoken about this in various forums that Indian education needs to be publicized. In most of the cases, what happens is that we have a website where there is, you know, the, uh, uh, it's mentioned about the scholarships and all that. But these are not properly publicized all the time. And most of the students don't have much knowledge or understanding of the procedure of admissions in India, as well as uh, the quality of education or the universities that have. Because, you know, there are so many universities in India, so one has to really select a number of universities who could be asked to sort of, uh, you know, publicize their programs, their faculty, and the various other strengths that they have. With the result, what happens is that since they are not done this way, most of the people don't have any knowledge about Indian education. And the students that are attracted to these countries are mostly through scholarships, and that too, the students are allotted universities according to the way the bureaucrats think that they can allot the students. So there's not much of choice in that sense. So I think it needs to be looked into properly, and Indian education and has to be publicized, attracted, not just scholarships alone, but also even through financial, I mean, if, you know, this, some of this could be advertised, you know, Delhi School of Economics or Jawaharlal Nehru University, you know, could be properly advertised. You know, students can even come on their own and study here compared to their visit to other countries in the West. So I think that needs a serious thinking, how India could act as a, uh, I mean, India 
can easily emerge also as a, uh, if not uh, an important hub like Singapore, but it can also emerge as an important hub for education for many of the countries, many of the students of Southeast Asia. I think that's that's a very good suggestion. Yeah, uh, Mr. Kerr, I would like to uh, also uh, add to that discussion. Uh, it's not just simply for promotion. But I guess you're doing that already. You're perfectly doing that. But I guess uh, we have you have to look at it on benchmarking uh, as well as in terms of branding or rebranding for that matter. Like, for instance, when we talk about Japan, we have Mumbo Kagusho. When we talk about USA, they have Fulbright. If they, when you talk about Germany, they have DAAD. And Australia, they have OSAID and so forth and so on. Why not? There is no such thing as an supposedly a coordinated uh, program that will cater both cultural and, and science and technology. The other uh, consideration and related to Dr. Ra uh, Professor Rajiv Rajan uh, on uh, Nalanda University is that it's not enough to have a student mobility uh, programs of internship and supervision or providing scholarship. I guess you have to look at it beyond that by say, for instance, aside from MOUs, you have to look at on uh, twining, the, the twinning uh, programs or of uh, joint programs uh, with the universities. Because if even if you uh, attract people, like Philipp student, Philippines, uh, Filipino students to come to India, definitely there is no incentive to stay there uh, quite longer. But if it is actually linked to the university as a you know joint program, or as a, a twin, uh, uh, the twinning programs of uh, universities like JNU or Nalanda University with National University in the Philippines, I think that, that would somehow uh, make a tie or a bind, uh, binding the, the programs and the people collaboration, particularly the younger ones. Uh, and that's all, uh, Mr. Che. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's another very important suggestion, the twinning program. And that could be done. For example, the University of Philippines, Jaliman, that's a good university. And, you know, universities like Delhi or Jawaharlal University can, you know, arrange some kind of a twinning program on certain areas where they find themselves quite strong in both the universities. So that, I think, is also another important suggestion that I think the government should take up. Any more comment from anyone? Maybe no, I actually, can add um, or uh, perhaps, although this is not related to education per se, um, Mr. Chair, but I, I think we should not just simply look at on the uh, high school or maybe graduate uh, students. Mm -hmm. We should also even target uh, those in the primary or secondary school students. Uh, by uh, perhaps popularizing Ramayana in animated animation. I, I saw really several animated uh, 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 movies. We also introduced and translated in various languages uh, in in Southeast Asia to somehow attract people to be more familiar of the uh, intangible, intangible uh, heritage or uh, the, the links of, of or the, the traces of India in Southeast Asia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Sir, also, in a way, you know, AI? Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, I was, uh, since uh, my previous speaker spoke about the tangible and intangible heritage, I just want to add one point. And which is a very actually this is a very important point that he was talking about that making aware of the tangible and intangible heritage. So with Ramayana, we ha can have also the Jataka stories because if you look at the tangible heritages of the South various Southeast Asian countries, we have such important representations of various Jatakas and this interflex, this this intermingling of the tangible with the intangible. Jataka isn't as a story is an intangible heritage which actually converts into a tangible heritage when it is represented in a sculpture or in a monastery or in a biharo. And so therefore knowledge of the Jataka stories when these, uh, it is linked also to tourism because when the tourists come and they see these and so this 
if they have some idea of the knowledge of the Jataka stories also, which are popular. Because all the Jatakas we don't have need, but there are certain Jatakas which are very popular in Southeast Asia. So those stories can be included in the early textbooks so that they get an idea, they get a feel of the place, and they know that what they are looking at, the visuals, and then they connect with the uh, text. So that's what's my contention. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's that's a good suggestion. That's a good suggestion. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, one last recommendation. I think it's also good that you know uh, the Indian government and even the private sectors should uh, provide some incentives for those filmmakers. Uh, we tried that before in you know the Filipino Filipino film productions uh, shoot actually in India for maybe two or three times, but it stopped after some time. So I think uh, maybe some incentives and. Uh, uh, bureaucratic processes uh, you know, uh, can be enhanced and uh, simplified by the government in India for, for this production. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think there's one more area where, which I think uh, Ms. Nalina could give some idea about is that the network of museums between the museums of ASEAN and India and how that really sort of brings the matter uh, for closer cooperation. Thank you, uh, Professor Ghoshal. I might also, before responding to your question, just add a little fact that I left out of my presentation. Um, you know, to address your earlier question about a two-way flow of culture, just similar to how <laughs> there are trade settlements in Southeast Asia, there's actually a settlement of a Malay community in Sri Lanka. Um, who were hmm. largely the byproduct of colonial movement, and they were sent there as militia and uh, really um, security personnel in aid of Dutch and British uh, conquests in that region. So that's still very much, uh, I think it's about 50,000 strong, perhaps, or maybe slightly less um, in terms of a diasporic community in Sri Lanka. Um, and to respond to your questions as someone who has been in this particular industry for some time now, I think there are on the ground some challenges, and it's very much uh, a person to person kind of uh, network. Now, you know, if we were to look at it more uh, regionally, I think there is the ASIMUS um, network. Um, that is under the um, Asia Europe Foundation. That's one of the networks that both the India and Southeast Asian museums and their professionals can actually connect. But if there was one um, you know, that might actually address um, the real sort of cultural exchange through exhibitions and perhaps research projects that can culminate either in India or Southeast Asia. So a network with a very specific goal I think that might be something that uh, would be functionally more effective. Good. I think that takes care of most of the areas that we have really identified in this particular session. And thank you very much to all the presenters. And I must also thank the organizers of this session. Uh, of this uh, conference, uh, the RIS and uh, ASEAN India Center and ICWA. And with that, I bring the seminar, uh, the discussion to a close. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of ICWA and AIC, we would like to thank all our distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, we will break for about uh, 15 minutes and we'll start with the third session on building consensus through regional cooperation at 3.15 Indian Saturday time. Thank you.